Welcome, my friends, to another installment of the Far Post podcast. It is week six of isolation for us. I understand at times it can feel like week 600, but we press on. We continue to record from home. We hope that you are staying home as often as you possibly can as well. I am your host, Jeff Lemieux. I haven't been booed nearly as much lately, which I appreciate, and I think there's good reason behind it. I think it's because people aren't wasting their time booing somebody like me and nobody who doesn't matter. Instead, they're taking their time to applaud all the essential workers who are keeping society ticking right now. So a round of applause for our essential workers. I appreciate that you're, you're taking your time to applaud them rather than boo me. So thanks for that. Uh, I am joined by my co-host, Elizabeth Pahoda. Elizabeth, how are you today? I'm good. How are you, Jeff? Not too bad. Yeah, press, pressing on as we do. I think that's I'm all we can do. I'm it was week six of quarantine and, and social distancing. I kind of have lost track at this point. Yeah, uh, we hit the one month mark early last week. So I feel like that was a that was a marker that I knew. And I knew that was week five. So now I, I was able to count from five to six. I'm not sure if I'll be able to go from six to seven next week. But we'll see. We'll see how you take it day by day. That's all you can you do. You have extra time to practice counting. So we'll, we'll give you another week to, to get to seven. And if you work up to it, you can show us what you learned. That's true. I know we've had a lot of players talking about learning new languages or studying economics and finance. I'm trying to, uh, hopefully by the end of isolation, I will be able to count to 10. That is my major goal. I've probably got a little while to do that. Uh, but we're hoping I'm up to six. So it's very exciting. Also exciting, uh, the fact that we are joined by a very special guest today, a long ago Rev, who is now once again a current Rev, Mr. Seth Sinovic. Seth, welcome to the show. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. How are you? How are you, how are you holding up? I think it's the most important question anyone can ask at this point. Yeah, we're, we're doing pretty good here. We, uh, you know, there's, there's certain days where we feel a little bit more cooped up than others, but for the most part, we consider ourselves pretty lucky and in, uh, in the situation we are. And um, obviously, like you, you mentioned, uh, very thankful for all the, the healthcare workers and all the essential workers that are you know, as slow as slow as things are right now, they're they're keeping our country moving um, uh, when we need them most. So, I'm um, very thankful for everybody that's putting themselves in the uh, in the line of fire. And I know one of the the silver linings of all this is, we, as we've talked to guys, is the opportunity to spend a ton of time with family. Everybody's kind of home with their families, 24 hours a day right now. We had Teal Bunbury on the show last week, and he has a five month old daughter at home, but it's his second child. So there's, there's a certain element of kind of knowing what you're dealing with at that point. You're home right now with a six and a half month old daughter and it's your first child. So how have you kind of adjusted to fatherhood with a newborn in the current situation? Honestly, it's been great. Uh, you know, this is probably time that I wouldn't have been able to spend with her uh, if we were having our regular season, you know, with away trips and being gone on certain weekends and training uh, throughout the day. So uh, I, I consider myself very lucky to spend uh, the extra time with her and it, it's been, it's been awesome. Um, it's a great stage to be cooped up because she's not quite at the stage where she's crawling around and running into things. So uh, she probably doesn't feel cooped up or anything like that. But um, honestly, our, our dog who's about to be a two year old golden retriever is a lot more difficult to deal with than she is. So, yeah. Are you prepared for your daughter Hattie to, to be mobile? Is that, are, are, do you feel like that's, on the horizon <laughs> we're we're getting there we actually had a uh her six month checkup not too long ago um which they did a really great job at the uh, pediatrics office it was just the doctor there um yeah, literally nobody else just the doctor and uh, she got her six month shots which is always sad and i wasn't actually allowed to go we were only allowed to have one parent so thankfully i didn't have to watch that but uh she told us we need to start start getting the uh the, the house ready for all of the uh, the bumps and bruises and you know the things that she might try to pick up or pull down. So uh, we, we are definitely getting close to getting in that mode. Yeah, my brother has a six month old and she's just, she's just starting to pull herself a little bit. And she, you know, it's one of those things where you can turn away for two seconds and she's moved a couple feet and they're like, oh man, that's not good. That's, I feel like that's a whole, that's a whole different ball game. Yeah, it's a scary, scary thing. Every, everybody tells me just when you think you have uh, things figured out, that's when they start doing something new and you got to prepare for something else. So. so she's not mobile yet, Seth, but what, what is kind of her behavior? Do you have any cute stories that you can share with us from the past she, couple weeks? Yeah, so she's starting to roll pretty consistently. Um, 
like I said, the dog is kind of the bigger issue because he thinks all of her toys are uh, his toys. Um, but I think my favorite thing, and I'm sure everybody can relate to seeing a, a giggling or laughing baby video, but she is starting to do the loud, hysterical laughing and giggles. And um, we got her on a pretty good one last night. So that, that's probably my favorite thing right now that she's doing is the hysterical laughing. And I, I did have on the list for this show your golden retriever, because this is a personal interest to me, obviously. We've <laughs> talked about your two-year-old golden retriever. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that he's, he's almost more difficult to, uh, yeah. to, to deal with than, than a six-month-old. How, how have you just tried to, to keep him active? How has he kind of dealt with the situation? Yeah, well, thankfully, we've got kind of an enclosed area where you can take him out and run around. And um, it's a decent-sized apartment complex, so there's little paths and trails to walk on while keeping a, a good distance. But um, as I'm sure you know, golden retrievers are, you know, the most lovable, playful, energetic, you know, always want to be doing something, always want to be the center of attention. So, um, you know, he takes, it takes a little bit of work with him, but I, I, I kid, cause he, he really is a good dog. He does great with the baby. Um, and he's, he's just, you know, if you're feeling down, he's got a good way of cheering you up cause he's, you know, cuddly and playful and all that. So yeah, he's been great. Have you been taking him on lots of walks? I know my neighborhood has been flooded with people, not flooded, that's a too strong of a word, but you look out the window, like anytime I look out the window, I see somebody walking their dog um, and myself included, my family, my dog is probably the biggest benefiter of this situation. He goes on like three walks a day. Granted, I'm with six people in a house, but still. <laughs> We've been trying to do family walks once or twice a day, uh, weather permitting. Obviously, we had snow not too long ago. Um, but yeah, we've, we've been doing a lot of walks and trying to uh, enjoy being outside and being together as much as possible because uh, it, it's pretty easy to get cabin fever if you're just uh, staying inside all day. And luckily, we're in a situation where we're able to do that. Chris Tierney also has a golden retriever. Has his golden retriever hung out with your golden retriever and if not when they first do meet can I be part of that interaction <laughs> we the dogs have not met yet we have discussed uh the fact that we both have golden retrievers and they'd probably be good uh, playmates so we'll uh once we get that arranged we'll make sure to give you the invite I appreciate that I know uh, what sorry do go ahead know, Elizabeth. do you guys know how old Chris's golden retriever is he about two as well I think he's a little bit older and I, I think it's a, I think it's a girl, but I'm not sure. Oh. I, I can't remember, but yeah, but I think she's a little bit older. So perfect playmates. Yeah, no, those uh, well, golden retrievers are playful and feel like they're puppies until like four or five years old anyways. So, <laughs> yeah. And I know you've obviously got your family here. You also have extended family around the country, around the world, really. Have you been able to stay in touch with family and does your sister, did I see, you have a sister who lives in South Korea right now? I do, yes. She's in South Korea. Her, uh, her husband is stationed uh, with, the, with the army out there. So yeah, she's, uh, she was actually in, in the States for a little while, um, uh, just visiting and then went back ooh, maybe two weeks ago or so, which is obviously a very scary thing to be traveling at this, this time of year. But she's, uh, she had to go there. She had to be quarantined for the 14 days and I think she's almost to that two week point and uh, she got a, she got tested right when she got there and she uh, test came back negative. And I think she does another test, but um, I know the government there is uh, very strict on, on the testing and making sure people are at home quarantining, quarantining if they're uh, at any high risk uh, places or situations. And then her husband in the military, they're, they're being very careful with that as well. Um, making sure that he's, he's not getting sick and potentially bring that on base. Shifting gears just to soccer life. I see yeah. everybody's lives are so different and have been so different for the past six, seven weeks or so. And I know for all you guys who are used to, to playing soccer every single day, being in the locker room, being on the training field, playing games every weekend, uh, it was kind of a, a very sudden halt to life in MLS. And for you, a player who's played in the league for 10, 11 years, a halt to the life that you've known for a decade. So how have you just kind of coped through the last six weeks to just kind of settle into what's, you know, the, I hate, I hate the phrase, but kind of the, what's been the new normal for the past couple of months. It's been challenging for sure. It's uh, you know, I think you miss the camaraderie and the chemistry within the group of guys that you usually have every day. Uh, you know, it, 
you know, practicing is, you know, playing soccer is everybody loves doing it. It's our, it's our job, but it's something we love to do. So we definitely miss the soccer side of things, but missing the everyday interaction with guys has probably been the most challenging thing. Uh, thankfully we've been doing some virtual workouts where we're getting in groups like seven or eight and uh, being able to interact, uh, albeit on zoom, but um, yeah, it, it's definitely been challenging. It's different. It's a new nor new normal, as you say, and uh, we're definitely looking forward to getting back to uh, seeing the guys on a regular basis and uh, hopefully playing games. Who's in your zoom workout group? We have, um, hopefully I don't miss anybody, miss anybody, but, uh, our trainer, Jared, uh, Mancian, Teal, um, Adam, uh, Adam uh, Buxa, uh, Alex, um, who am I missing here? Farrell, and I think there's one more, gosh. It's oh, funny, uh, Brad Knighton. It's the same group because we, we had Buxa on a couple weeks ago, and he was talking mm -hmm. about it, and then we had Teal on last week, and we were getting all the guys from, from the same uh, – Yep. Zoom workout groups. Buxa, Buxa and Teal both said that those workouts are are no joke. Oh, they're difficult. Yeah, they're definitely difficult. I'm dripping sweat by the end of them. So, um, but they're fun. I, it's like I said, it's good good to interact with the guys, and um, but that's all stuff that we can do our own on our own. But at the same time, you can't really replace the interaction and camaraderie that you get from it. Are the workouts changed every single time? So when you come into a new Zoom session with those guys, it's a different setup. A little bit. There's different lifts or different strength strength exercises. Um, for the most part, the bike workout has been pretty much the same, but uh, the, the uh, uh, strength and things like that have changed up a little bit. But it, it's good. It's fun. That's awesome. How creative have you had to get with some of your workouts? I know we posted a video mm -hmm. with uh, with Jared Phillips yesterday at home with the pros, presented by United Healthcare, and he's taking water bottles and filling them up with water and putting them in. <laughs> grocery bags so that you can have some weights if you don't have traditional weights at home. Like how creative have you had to get a little bit with, uh, with kind of keeping yourself ready to go? Yeah, pretty creative. I'm pretty sure Teal in the last session had like a diaper bag for one of his lifting things and then something else. But uh, yeah, you, you got to mix it up a little bit. Uh, my wife has been doing some of the video virtual classes. She tried to get me to do a dance class with her. I can't dance. So that was a complete fail. Uh, but yeah, trying to do some virtual classes like that, even when we're not doing it with the team. So, uh, you try and find whatever you can around the house to, to give yourself some weights. And, um, we moved the coffee table out of the living room permanently or, uh, indefinitely, I should say, uh, to make space for, uh, classes and things like that. So you got to get a little bit creative. So if we decide to do a feature for the website where we have one of the players teach a dance workout class. You're, what I what I'm hearing is you you want to be the guy who teaches that class. That's oh absolutely yeah. what I would, what I I would kill there. that. Yeah, <laughs> I would kill it. How you mentioned moving the moving the coffee table to give yourself some space. Like how how decent is your setup with the apartment, the apartment complex, the outdoors? Like how nice is the setup for you in terms of being able to to accomplish what you need to accomplish? What's that setup like? I can pretty much do everything I need to, uh, aside from the actual soccer aspect of it. From the fitness standpoint, I can do uh, any sort of running that I want to do outside. There's a company that's you know, probably a quarter mile away from us that has a huge parking lot that I've basically turned into my own personal track. Uh, so that's kind of, I'll just run laps around that uh, whenever we're doing distance running. Plenty of area for sprints. Uh, there's a couple, uh, there's a baseball field not too far from us. There's a local um school I think it's uh, elementary school that I can just walk through the woods and that's always empty so if I need to do sprints or uh, kick it around on the field but uh, as you probably can imagine it's hard to replicate the soccer soccer side of things but I feel like I'm keeping in pretty good shape and I know six weeks ago when we were you know, still preparing for games you were dealing with a little bit of an injury have you had time to to get yourself back to to full health over the course of the last six weeks working out at home yeah, the, the, the preseason was definitely a frustrating preseason for me. I had a little, uh, little hamstring tweak, and uh, that was kind of nagging me throughout the preseason, so I didn't feel like I was 100% the entire time, which is, is frustrating being with a new team. Um, but, yeah, this, is, this has been an opportunity for me to get healthy, to uh, really build strength in the hamstring, and uh, hopefully come back flying when, uh, whenever we get back to it. Yeah, I know the, the point of all of this is obviously to keep yourselves ready 
for whenever it is that you are able to get back onto the field. And obviously there's a lot, a lot of rumors floating out there about how leagues could get themselves back into the mix. MLS commissioner Don Garber has said you know, publicly that they're looking at all different options, that one of those options could potentially be first coming back and playing games behind closed doors at neutral venues. So as players, have you had conversations with your teammates about those scenarios? What kind of would be that, you know, that feeling for players potentially getting back into things at first behind closed doors? We talk a little bit about it. I, I think some of the ideas that Don Garber has brought up have been discussed with players and I'm, I, I'm not a, a player rep for the players association, but uh, I, I do hear a little bit from guys, but there's been quite a few things have been discussed. I think one thing that's uh, good to see is I think Germany I heard is going to be playing probably before most teams. And I think they've discussed uh, closed door scrimmages or not scrimmages, closed door games. And I'm not sure if it's going to be a neutral site or, or whatnot, but it'll be probably good for the MLS to be able to see other countries and other leagues around the world um, bring back sports with hopefully with success. I know South Korea is in their preseason for ba baseball right now, and they're doing it without fans. Although I think I did see where they put cardboard cutouts of fans in the stands just to try and replicate it a little bit. But um, yeah, I, I think that the countries that are a little bit farther along in this pandemic than we are, hopefully will give us a, um, a pathway and a view of how to do things, uh, slowly integrating sports back in and hopefully bringing fans back because I, I think fans are what make uh, the game so special. Yeah, I did see that video of uh, South Korea baseball employees literally setting up mannequins in the stands, putting jerseys on the mannequins, right. putting hats on. Not quite the same thing, I don't think, as having uh, right. having real life fans in the stands. But yeah, it, it's I think it's going to be a little bit of trial and error for uh, for everybody. But as soon as as soon as we can get sports back on the field, I think everybody will be will be ready for that in whatever whatever manner it comes. Uh, and you guys are trying to stay ready for that physically by working out as often as you possibly can in the comfort of your own homes. And another big element of that is eating right. I, and typically you're at the training center every day, you're getting breakfast, lunch, you could potentially take a meal to go from the training center. So a lot of that is, is handled for you throughout the course of the year. Uh, how adept are you in the kitchen? What's, what's meal prep been like for you for the course of the past month or so? I have my go-tos when it comes to cooking. Uh, I, I'm pretty good with salmon. Uh, we as a family have some go-tos that we like. We, uh, um, a lot of like stir fry type options or um, like Mexican bowls or something like that. Uh, my wife is a very good cook. I think the biggest challenge with the eating is, you know, when you're at home so often, it's almost becomes like an activity to do. You're just like, Oh, well, what, if I'm not doing anything, I'll see what's in the cabinet or see what's in the refrigerator and try to avoid snacking as much as possible because that becomes a, a bad habit. And like I said, something to do. So um, for the most part, I think we're pretty healthy eaters here. I've got a little bit of a sweet tooth, which I'll indulge occasionally, but um, yeah, that's uh, it's really, really not too bad. Not too much different for us. Seth, you mentioned you have a sweet tooth. I have a big sweet tooth as well. And I definitely have indulged in that while being home. If you are going to treat yourself, what is that dessert that you go to? So I would say Sour Patch Kids are, I'm, I'm a, like a candy sweet tooth person. So Sour Patch Kids, anything sour is kind of my go-to. Um, my biggest issue when it comes to sweets is if you give me a bag of something, I'm finishing it then and there. It's, it doesn't matter if it's a giant bag of Sour Patch Kids. I think my wife ordered a, um, like one of those variety packs that you'll see like on Halloween. She ordered that for as Easter candy, just kind of as a fun gift for me. That was gone within like a day and a half. I, I just cannot, if it's there, I'm going to finish it. So uh, that's my biggest issue. But outside of candy, ice cream is another big one for me. Ooh, ice cream's a good yeah. one. I mean, basically Sour Patch Kids, the bag is the portion, right? They wouldn't put it in a right. bag if they didn't want you to eat it. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's like Joe Bunbury snack too. He said he loves Sour Patch Kids as well. Oh yeah. Teal and I are, are very similar when it comes to candy. We're, uh, We've spent some preseason, obviously this preseason, but back in Kansas City, I know that was a, uh, um, a big point um, uh, of common ground that we had is uh, just eating candy. We were, we were big candy people in preseason in Kansas City. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I didn't know if that was a, a Kansas City thing or what, but Teal, I mean, Teal's been with the Reds <laughs> since 2014 now, and, and every flight, you know, that's, 
you'll see Teal with a, with a little bag of candy. It's just, he's got that sweet tooth. He's got to satisfy. And every, every time we ask guys about, you know, when you do indulge, what do you, what do you indulge in? A lot of guys will say, well, I like some chocolate. I like some ice cream. And Teal's the one who's like, yeah, candy, sour patties. Yeah. And I did see someone posted the other day. You probably don't want to know this. Someone posted <laughs> that I think on Amazon, they sell like a two pound bag of just red sour patch kids. So you could get that and then you could eat in one sitting two pounds of red Sour Patch Kids. Uh, I like that. I had a five pound bag <laughs> sent to me for my birthday uh, one preseason by my brother and sister and that was gone in less than a week, which is actually disgusting if you think about it, but yeah. Which color is your favorite? Uh, blue, red, and yellow, I would say. Okay, I like it. Now we mentioned the, the Kansas City connection. Obviously you're a Kansas City guy. When we talk about food, in Kansas City, obviously barbecue is going to come up. Are you, are you like a, a barbecue connoisseur of Kansas City barbecue, having grown up there and lived there for so long? I don't know if I'd consider myself a connoisseur, but I definitely have my favorites. Um, I'll have to ask you if you've uh, gone there at all, uh, or if you have any favorites if you've eaten there in KC. So what's unfortunate, I guess, is we the first time we went to barbecue there, we went to Jack Stack. Okay. And it was so good that we just kept going to Jack Stack. So every time I'm in Kansas City, we end up going to dinner at Jack Stack. So I haven't really had any of the other Kansas City barbecue yeah. because we did Jack Stack first. And I'm like, well, if I go to Kansas City and don't get Jack Stack, I'm going to have missed out on it. So I know Jack Stack's one of like the five that is kind of always in the list of the top ones everyone talks about. But what's, what's your Kansas City go-to barbecue? I love Jack, Jack Stack, by the way. That's, that is – there's like three that are interchangeable for me. Um, so Jack's deck is incredible. That's probably the best restaurant experience. If you're going to go have a sit down meal there. Um, LC's barbecue is one of my favorites. Uh, it's kind of a hole in the wall, uh, off beaten path one. Um, but that they have the best sauce in my opinion. Um, and then Q39 is a very good one. That's a newer one. Uh, the one that most people talk about is Joe's Kansas city. That's the one that's in the gas station. Yeah. And it's probably considered blasphemous that I'm saying this, but that's like four or five on my list. Um, wow. Even though it's very good, like it's, it's, it's excellent barbecue, but if I'm, if you're going to, you know, make me choose, uh, yeah, Jack Stack and LC's are probably my favorite, which by the way, I've been researching and Jack Stack's, Jack Stack will ship stuff uh, out of state for you. So I've been looking into that. Man, I was going to say it's, it's Oklahoma Joe's that always comes up. And then I know yep. people talk about Gates. So you've got some, you've got some off the beaten path ones, which I kind of like. Yep. I yep. also like how you have your favorite sauce and your favorite like actual barbecue to yeah. the different elements, because that shows that you are a barbecue connoisseur because you have favorites from all those different places. Yeah, no, they're, they're, I mean, all of them are so good. And even like in the, what people consider like a top five, like, Gates is excellent too, but uh, Arthur Bryant's is one of the originals. Um, but there's, there's so many small little uh, mom and pop shops that you don't even hear about that are, or that are excellent. So that's definitely something I'm missing about uh, Kansas City is the barbecue for sure. I was going to say, have you found anything outside of Kansas City that can even come close in terms of barbecue for you? I mean, obviously you're living in Boston now. We're not exactly known for right. our barbecue. But is there anything that you go to to try to satisfy that barbecue craving? We honestly, we didn't, really didn't get the opportunity yet with uh, with the pandemic ending. We haven't um, had a, had an opportunity to to find any of those places. Uh, we really like Mexican food too. Um, so if you guys have any recommendations for uh, barbecue or Mexican here, uh, that would be great. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I I know there's really good Italian here in Boston, which we were looking forward to doing. Um, so yeah, there's we're, we're looking forward to a lot of the the good uh, food options here in Boston, whatever things settle down a little bit. Yeah, seafood as well, obviously. You got Italian in the North End. Seafood pretty much anywhere yes. around yeah. here is going to be absolutely delicious. I grew up uh, grew up on, on seafood. and uh, I mean, what we do really well is fried seafood, which you probably okay. don't want to eat quite as much. But when you have an opportunity to grab some fried seafood in, uh, in the Northeast, absolutely delicious. Um, now you're you're a big Kansas City sports fan too. Obviously, now your allegiances lie completely in New England, uh, and that's mm -hmm. that's just the way Absolutely. that it works. Yeah. <laughs> but who is uh, you, you've had you've had a decent little run with Kansas City sports. You had the Royals won a World Series not that long ago. Obviously, the Chiefs being defending Super Bowl champs. Uh, do you have a an all time favorite Kansas City athlete? Ooh, 
That's a good question. There's a lot. I mean, it's pretty – Mahomes is creeping up the list really quickly, which is <laughs> probably not that hard to imagine. Um, man, there's – God, there's – I I really liked Priest Holmes back in the day as far as the Chiefs go. Um, Tony Gonzalez was another uh, big-time uh, hometown favorite. Um, as far as the Royals go, I'd say, I'm more of a Royals fan than the Chiefs fan. It's not by much, but I'm definitely more of a Royals guy. Um, love George Brett growing up. Um, Mike Sweeney. Uh, obviously, we didn't have a ton of great options uh, as far as Royals players uh, went for about 30 years or so. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm just a big sports fan in general. I love Kansas City sports. Um, grew up with it and love college basketball. Um, obviously a Revs guy now, but, uh, uh, it was funny when, when I did sign here or when I was about to sign and then ended up signing here, uh, the first thing that the majority of people would ask me or would not ask me, they would tell me like, Hey, you cannot become a new England Patriots fan. That was like the first thing people brought up, which is just <laughs> crazy that that's the first thing that comes in people's minds. But, um, I thought that was pretty funny. Well, that is funny. I mean, that would have been difficult a few years ago, because obviously at that point it would have been easy to just say, hey, Patriots are top of the heap. I'm going to be a Pats fan. But with the Chiefs winning the Super Bowl this past year, I mean, it's it's kind of tough to change allegiances at that point when, when you, right. you got allegiance to the defending Super Bowl champs. Right. I, dude, yeah, I it, forgot all about – Priest Holmes, was a, he was a fantasy football legend. Oh, yeah. He was, he was like top yeah. pick every year. You knew he was going to – you knew he was going to have between like 15 and 18 touchdowns every year. Yeah, he was such a likable guy, and I, I, I root for the guys that are uh, um, not all. I mean, I like big personalities and guys like that, but I, I root for the guys that are you hear about being just really good guys off the field as well. And he was he was definitely one of those guys. Um, but yeah, when it comes to the Patriots, I <laughs> I dislike the Patriots, but it's all from like a respect standpoint. It's it's like the the team that the Chiefs were never able to beat. We'd always lose to them if we made it to a point in the playoffs to play them. Um, it's like purely out of respect. Like I can't stand Tom Brady, but it was all because we could never beat him. I respect him like, like no other. And I think he's obviously the best quarterback of all time, but my dislike from uh, a Patriots or a Tom Brady fan uh, all came from a respect of God, we wish he could beat him type of thing. So. And nobody hates you if you're irrelevant. You know, that's, that's, that's the way true. it works. Yeah. Patriots ha get a lot of hate. And, you know, if they weren't six-time Super Bowl champions, I guess they probably wouldn't get a lot of that hate. Yeah. If you're uh, not being hated, you're not doing – you're doing something wrong, so. That's true. Well, I would agree in most cases except for – and I want to transition to this because I think this is one person on the planet who nobody hates. And he's my favorite person ever, and he's from Kansas City, and I'm so jealous that he's a Kansas City native, is Paul Rudd. Yeah. Have you have you had the opportunity to interact with Paul Rudd? Or what, what's what's the view of Paul Rudd in Kansas City? He is one of the most beloved guys uh, around. I have not had the opportunity to meet him, but I have heard nothing but great things about him. Um, there's a uh, charity baseball event that Paul Rudd and a few other uh, uh, Kansas City comedians, uh, Rob Riggles in that group, um, and a few others – they put on this thing called the big slick every year and it actually got canceled this year due to the pandemic, but uh, raising funds for children's mercy uh, children's hospital uh, in Kansas wow. city. Um, but a few of the guys that played for sporting got to play in this softball event and uh, Benny Failhaber was one of them. So Benny knows him and is, uh, is kind of on a very limited texting basis with him and uh, actually responds to him occasionally. And uh, yeah, everybody I've talked to says he's just the nicest guy and, um, yeah, he's, he's somebody that Kansas City is very proud of, I think. I love how he was integrated into the Super Bowl campaign for them this year and that they just <laughs> used him as much as possible because it made me excited for the Super Bowl. And I'm a Patrick Mahomes fan. Obviously, I'm a Patriots fan completely, but I really like Patrick right. Mahomes. So to also have Paul Rudd, who's just absolutely incredible as well, pairing with them was just great to see overall. Yeah. It's, exci it's exciting news for me that there's – theoretically one degree of separation between me <laughs> and Paul Rudd. That's exciting news. Yeah. I don't have to get I, in touch with Benny. The, 
you know what's crazy about Paul Rudd is you keep seeing these like pictures of him from like 20 years ago and how he doesn't age. It's incredible. It he is. just turned 50. Yeah. Paul Rudd is 50 it's, years old. Yeah. Is he really he 50 years old? <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that. For some reason, I thought he was a lot younger than that. He no. looks the exact same as like pictures from the movie Clueless. It's crazy. And <laughs> Clueless was like, that was his like breakthrough role was yep. Clueless. And he was, I don't know, early 20s or something like that. And yeah, that was, I don't know, early, early 90s or something like that, mid 90s. Um, yeah, I just, I don't know. Paul Rudd, and he's the only person, everyone always says, you know, you can't please everybody. But I disagree in one instance, <laughs> Paul Rudd. All right, yeah. well, I'm sure I, I've probably been watching uh, some, some Paul Rudd movies to pass the time. I know you're obviously keeping pretty busy. You've got a six month old at home. You've got a two year old golden retriever at home. So I'm sure a lot of your time is occupied. But when you have had a chance to step away a little bit, have you had a t an opportunity to, to binge any TV shows, watch any new movies or anything like that? How have you passed the time? A little bit. Um, we've got some movies that I'm pretty proud that I watch or that I've watched. And I've got some movies that I'm kind of embarrassed or shows that I'm embarrassed about. I want to hear about. about those ones. Yeah, I like both. Uh, <laughs> we got to hear both. Okay, I'm kind of, I'm a pretty big movie guy. Um, I would say my favorite movie this year uh, that I've watched recently was uh, Jojo Rabbit. I really, really like that movie. I just watched that. that. Yeah, I think it's really well done. It's it's pretty funny, although dark at the same time. Uh, and just, I thought a really good, like, heartfelt movie. Uh, so I like that. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, my guilty pleasure show is Vanderpump Rules, and I'm truly embarrassed to say that I watched that. Uh, my wife is a big Bachelor fan, so she's listening or watching the uh, Listen to Your Heart show, which I've refused to watch this one, although I'll watch other Bachelorette shows, or Bachelor or Bachelorette shows with her. Um, God, I'm trying to think. I, I knew you were going to ask this question, so I should have been more prepared. But, um, but yeah, Jojo Rabbit's definitely top of my list as far as movies to watch. Yeah, Jojo Rabbit was top movie for me. I, I loved Parasite, loved that it won mm -hmm. the Oscar. If it was up to me, Jojo Rabbit was my favorite film from last year. Absolutely yeah. loved that movie. I can't say I know uh, Vanderpump Rules, so I can't really give you any crap for that because I don't know what I'm, it is. Yeah, yeah I don't I'm either. proud of you. <laughs> it's but, basically uh, a, uh, it's a Bravo show and it's um, – one of the ladies from the Real Housewives from Los Angeles or whatever, she's a billionaire and she's got some uh, um, some restaurants in Los Angeles and it basically follows the lives of the waitresses and uh, bartenders from the show. It's, okay. it's truly awful. We've, we've all got our guilty pleasures. If I am flipping through the channels and Catfish is on MTV, <laughs> I am watching Catfish. I am fascinated by that show. So like, it's not like I'm proud of it but uh yeah I'm, I'm watching i've seen every episode everybody everybody's got their guilty pleasures um we talked to some guys too who have you know they're they're using this time quite impressively to like we're talking to adam books and he's like well i've decided to take a bunch of courses and study finance and economics and you know, feral playing piano all day every day and putting together like the best tiktok account ever if you could if you had the time which with a six month old at home i'm sure you don't if you could come out of isolation with one skill that you don't currently have you could just flip a switch and you had that skill what skill would you love to be able to come out of isolation with? i would love to be able to speak another language fluently um i think i i would assume a lot of people would say similar things but i i've taken years and years of spanish and i can understand you know broken sentences or i can understand little things and I can speak in broken sentences, but I would love to be able to speak that fluently, especially considering the profession that I'm in because there's so many guys that speak Spanish and I, I feel like I'd be able to connect to those guys a little bit better. Yeah. Same for me. We've had players on the team who speak six languages and I consider them like Jose Gonzalez spoke six languages, six languages. To me, he's the smartest man on the planet. <laughs> like that to me is just, it's mind blowing. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, well, we, we typically finish up with a little game of Would You Rather. So you up, okay. for, you up for playing a quick game of, of Would You Rather before we let you go? Let's, yeah, let's do it. All right, so some will be soccer-related. Some won't be soccer-related. They'll be, they'll be completely off the wall. Um, all right, we'll start with a soccer-related one. To win MLS Cup, 
which you have done, would you rather provide the assist on a last second goal to win MLS Cup or clear a last second shot off the line to secure MLS Cup? I'm not going to ask whether you'd rather score the winning goal because I think everyone would rather score the winning goal, but provide the assist on the winning goal or clear a potential equalizer off the line. I think clear a potential equalizer. I think, uh, I think that would be a pretty cool one. Um, I don't really have any specific reason why I, I just, I would get, I've had, um, obviously I've played a long time. I don't have a ton of assists, uh, don't have a ton of goal line clearances, but you get a little bit uh, bigger shot of adrenaline, I think from a goal line clearance than you do from a, an assist. At least I do. This is, this is a tough one. And this is almost cheating because uh, I'm going to ask basically for you to give one thing up. Would you rather never be able to eat Kansas city barbecue again? or never be able to golf again? Because I know you're a big golfer. Ooh, uh, that's really difficult. Um, golf or barbecue? Uh, I'd probably give up barbecue. I love sports. I love golf. I love, yeah, I love sports too much to give up any sport. You can eat barbecue outside Kansas City. It's obviously not going to be as good. <laughs> But right. you could still try to replicate it as much as possible. Yeah, maybe I'll head to Texas or Memphis or one of the Carolinas or something. Yeah, they got some some Carolina barbecue. It's different, but it's, it's not good. as good. It's not as good, but it's, it's true. Yeah. That's what people say when it's not. They say, "Well, it's different." That means it's not. Different. <laughs> no. You, speaking of that MLS Cup victory, you've played in what is officially the coldest game in MLS history. Mm-hmm. Would you rather play in? 20 degree cold or 100 degree heat cold hands down yeah because i've played the, it you can you get warmed up pretty quickly in that like i you definitely weren't cold in that game and i think it was what'd you say 22 degrees it was it was 22 and, officially i think yeah. well, i don't know and what the like wind chill was i think yeah, yeah it was definitely in the teens um that wasn't that bad once you get running around i think the worst part about that was the ball was frozen and actually half the field is frozen frozen because the heater heaters under the field weren't working on half the field um but actually running around and things like that that wasn't bad heat and humidity is the worst the worst condition outside of extremely windy to play in that's uh yeah i would definitely take the cold over the heat would you rather i'm interested on this question because we've asked some really tall guys this question but i'm, I'm interested to ask someone who's kind of average height this question. Would you rather be four foot five or seven foot seven? Uh, seven foot seven, because I think I'd be playing in the NBA and making a lot of money. <laughs> there. I always hear some, I always just see like our guys, we'll see have like six foot three, six foot four guys on commercial flights. And it just looks so shockingly uncomfortable. That's the, yeah. that's one of the only times in my life that I'm like, thank God I'm only five, seven. Cause I can sit comfortably <laughs> on this plane right now. Um, yeah. But I, th- I think that's probably the right call. If I'm All seven, right. seven, I'm playing in the NBA and I'm taking <laughs> charter flights everywhere. Fair enough. There you go. Would you rather finally have a free kick competition against Chris Tierney or against Dave Vandenberg? Oh man. I, I would I, yeah. It, initially, uh, prior to coming here, I would say against uh, – uh, you're su- assuming I would want to win this competition. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, before coming here, I would definitely say I'd rather go against Dave. Um, but having been here and seeing him training with us, I think I might go against Chris. And Chris is incredible at free kicks, it, as you guys are well aware. Uh, but Dave is, uh, yeah, Dave's impressive and still out there, you know, showing people up and, uh, basically putting the ball wherever he wants to when he's playing. So, uh, yeah, he's, uh, I would definitely, I think I would go against Chris. I've thrown Vandenberg into a few of the, would you rather questions basically just because I'm trying to get the word out there that Dave Vandenberg have, has one of the best left feet in major league soccer, even though he retired, I don't know eight, nine, ten years ago, that dude's left foot yeah. is unreal. And to clear up any confusion, this is not like a sucking up to the coaches type of thing. He is <laughs> no. legit. This is a legit, unbiased answer. Good clarification. Yeah. 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 All right. 
Uh, well, Seth, we, we really appreciate you taking the time. I'm not gonna let you go without one final question. And we've talked about this before. It's more, it's more just presenting an opportunity for you rather than a question um, in, a, in a joking manner, obviously. But we've, we've talked about the fact that uh, you haven't scored a ton of goals in your career, but you did score an absolutely massive goal for Sporting Kansas City, which unfortunately was a massive goal in the opposite direction for the New England Revolution. You scored a goal that essentially ended up leading to the Rebs uh, being knocked out of the 2013 MLS Cup playoffs en route to your championship with Sporting Kansas City. So as someone who has, in essence, ended a New England Revolution season and is now on the New England Revolution roster, do you have uh, a mea culpa? Do you have a message to the fans as, uh, as you join New England now seven years later? Uh, I would just say, you know, I, I think experience plays a huge, huge role in things. And, um, you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to become, be a part of um, four championship teams, three open cup and one uh, MLS cup. And I, I know what a good team looks like. And I know what a team uh, that's capable of winning looks like. And I truly believe this team has the ability to, uh, to do some special things. So um, I'm hoping we get back to the playing field uh, sooner than later and obviously in a very safe way. And uh, I would love to have the fans back, uh, you know, again, in a safe way as soon as we can, because uh, we all miss the game. We all miss, all miss the fans. And uh, like I said, I think we've got an opportunity to do some special things this year. I'll stop ribbing you about that goal in a couple of years. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> that was uh yeah, that was a, uh, that was a good goal. It's, it kind of makes it better that, uh, I scored on Reese because I can always, uh, I've always got that under my belt when it comes to talking uh, smack with him. So. Yeah, that was the, I, that was the second to last goal that Matt Reese ever conceded in his career. So yeah. you've got, you've got that under the belt. He was a decent yeah. goalkeeper. He was, uh, he was okay. <laughs> it's all right. All right. Well, Seth, uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks so much uh, for giving us a little bit of insight into uh into your life the past six weeks uh, hope you and the family continue to stay safe stay fit and hopefully we will see you back out on the field uh, as soon as humanly possible all right thank you guys for having me stay safe uh stay indoors and hopefully see you soon thanks so much thanks, Seth. All right. thanks for listening and watching everybody we'll see you soon on the far post podcast